in commoning and well-being that from these years are funded by the Angelini Foundation whose uh, uh, director and president I'd like to introduce to everybody. Here, please, you give a round of applause. I'm always very happy when some, uh, some donor understands the importance of this, uh, of this institution and particularly when they come to see what is going on because many times uh, donors uh, just give some money to, to feel good but they never come. And if they don't come, they don't understand what is happening here, what kind of chemistry comes out, and what kind of new ideas develop in this context. So the best thing is to have uh, uh, occasions like this, in which uh, what they consider the best law teacher in the world is actually addressing us uh, to see what's happening. Okay? Uh, Guido Calabresi is, uh, uh, among many other things, now is, the, is a uh, judge for the Second Circuit Court of Appeal in the United States, has been a long-time professor of law, uh, sterling professor of law at Yale Law School and uh, dean of Yale Law School for also a very long time, a very defining moment of the school. It was after Guido's leadership that Yale established itself as the undisputed number one in the United States. I don't think it never went down again to number two. So that's the first time it happened with him. So it's like the federal of deans or something like that. Okay? Uh, so uh, Guido is, uh, in 1961, started a very important reflection on uh, um, tort law and uh, economic analysis of tort law and has been recognized worldwide as one of the two figures that actually produced this very, very amazing global movement called Lined Economics, which we critically approach here, and that also Guido approaches uh, very critically for, uh, in, uh, for, for, for a long time. His uh, book, the, his most important book is The Cost of Accident, uh, um, an introduction to land economics from the perspective of thoughts. And then he had other, a number of other books. Uh, the one that I was discussing yesterday with him, the one that I love most, is called A Common Law for the Age of Statutes, that I always use when I teach interpretation. Uh, Guido uh, received more than 50 honoris causa degree in the world. This gives you a sense of his uh, impact. Uh, I think he has uh, some hundreds of former students that are now law professors in the United States. They're now retired. Yeah. And that's so the way. Many of them are retired. I'm proud to be one of those. I, I met Guido in a very uh, touching moment, of, in a very turning point of my life. I was almost a little younger than you now. I was 22, 21, 22. And Guido delivered a talk in uh, uh, Pisa, in Italy. And they went there, they said, Guido, uh, I would like, uh, I'm, I'm Ugo Mate, blah, 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 and I would like to come and study with you in the United States. And he said, oh, you know, we talked for a few moments, and then I went away, and then after a few weeks, I got a letter that said, you've been a congratulations, you've been appointed a visiting scholar and civil liability associate at Yale Law School, which, you know, I knew that Yale was a very important school, but I had no idea what that meant, really, uh, until I arrived there. And then everybody was extremely impressed because the other visiting scholars were all kind of big faculty members and they was like little kid there. And, 
<laughs> and, and, and so I thought so he really kind of uh, uh, changed my, 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 my life from that point of view. Later on in my career, uh, like six or seven years ago, I had a very similar experience on the other side. Uh, a student from uh, Chile uh, approached me when I was giving a talk in Peru at the end of my conference and he said, I came all the way here from Chile, to, I want to come to study with you in Italy. I said, wow. And so I, and he, then he came to Italy, I did pretty, pretty much the same thing, I was not at Yale, so he got an invitation in Torino, which is not the same thing, but now he is actually, now he is actually a professor of law at the University of Easter Piedmont, he moved to Italy, he married here, has kids, and so it was, and, and, and when I did that, I was completely doing, following the path that Guido had taught me in the way of approaching people that actually try to study and to understand things, okay? So without further ado, Guido, thank you very much for being here. So, I'm going to talk for a little while about altruism and not-for-profits this morning. Uh, this afternoon, as part of this series of seminars on well-being, uh, this afternoon I'm going to talk about different approaches to law as part of the seminars that you have on critical legal studies and uh, suggest a different view of critical legal studies than many have. Uh, I'm going to talk about this and altruism, uh, but then afterwards I'm happy to answer questions not just about what I've talked about, but about anything else that might interest you. Because I'm a bit unusual in that I am both a uh, judge, and I've been a judge now for 20 years, it's hard to believe because I became a judge when I was in my 60s, when most people retire, and President Clinton asked me to become a judge, and I became a judge then. And so I've been a judge for 20 years, but I've continued to teach regularly and still do. I now am senior enough as a judge so I can judge as much as I want, and I judge two-thirds time. And I'm senior enough so that I can teach as much as I want. So when I teach two-thirds time, this leaves me some time to write, which shows that my mathematics is terrible, <laughs> uh, which is very good for people who do law and economics, not to be too good in mathematics. Uh, so I do both. And if you want to ask me questions, not just about my work, which I'll be talking about as a scholar, but also my work as a judge, I'd be happy to answer. For example, what does a judge do when he faces, she faces, law that is truly immoral? I believe the death penalty is an abomination. And yet I live in a country which has the death penalty for some things. What does a judge do in that situation? But anything else of that sort. So whether now or this afternoon or what have you, I'd be happy to talk about those things as well. Uh, about altruism and not-for-profits and beneficence, I want to put that in a kind of context first. I'm now writing a book, which I call The Future of Law and Economics. And the basic theme of this book, which this talk will take off from, is that, um, uh, well, let's start with a little story. John Stuart Mill, in 1850, was asked who were the seminal minds of the century, 1750 to 1850. And he answered, rather surprisingly, Coleridge, the poet, it's kind of nice if you think of somebody saying that, and of course Bentham. Bentham, the great philosopher, and so on. And then of Bentham, he said, he approached all ideas as a stranger. Nice love. All ideas as a stranger. And if they did not fit his theory, utilitarianism, he dismissed them as vague generalities. <laughs> nonsense, nonsense on stills. And then Mill said what he did not realize though, was that in those vague generalities lay the whole unanalyzed experience of the human race. But often, when the theory doesn't fit, it isn't that the world, the theory doesn't fit the world, it isn't that the world is crazy or irrational, it's that the theory is not good enough. 
And that male, being a utilitarian himself, is sometimes when you look deeper, you find that the world is exploiting people, is wrong, its ideas are no good, and have to be updated. But other times, it's the theory that is not up to you. And what I'm doing in this book, in a series of different things, looking at economic theory, looking at the world, and where the world doesn't fit, seeing if the problem is that the world is irrational. You know that wonderful word that economists have. They don't like something that's irrational. And usually when they say irrational, it means they can't explain it. <laughs> uh, and then go back and see if by making the theory more complicated, you can not only explain this, but then learn all sorts of other things about the world which would be useful. And of course, the great example of this is right at the beginning of law and economics in Ronald Coase. Ronald Coase, in the theory of the firm, which he wrote in the 1920s, said if markets were costless, there would be no firms. A firm is a command structure. You do everything by market, by negotiation. But we have firms. They are there. Do we say that the world is crazy? Or do we say, is it so difficult for economic theory that markets also cost money? And that sometimes command is cheaper, more effective than markets. And he did that. And from that grew any number of wonderful things, interestingly. When Coase wrote the theory of the firm, nobody paid any attention to him. When he wrote the same thing 30 years later, the problem of social cost, everybody paid attention to him. And there's a funny reason in that, because when he wrote the theory of the firm, the nature of the firm, Coase was a socialist. And he was describing how sometimes command structures work better than markets. When he wrote the problem of social cost, he'd become a libertarian, and he wrote how markets sometimes do better than command, than cure command, and both things are true. It's kind of interesting sort of in the history of politics that few people paid attention to him when he wrote the first, a lot of people paid attention to him when he wrote the second, but both are true. And if you took a look at the cost of command and the cost of markets, you start to see not just why there are firms, but any number of other things. So this is what I do in this book, in a variety of different things. Today, I'll do it as uh, to, this morning, as to altruism, beneficence, not for profits. And here's the problem. When economists traditionally talk about altruism, beneficence, not for profit, they always talk about it as a means, as a way of getting from here to here. Is altruism, beneficence, not for profit, an efficient way of delivering health care? Is it an efficient way of delivering education? Or would it be more efficient to do it through self-interest, through markets, through allowing people to make money. And when they do that, they almost always, not always, but almost always, find that self-interest would be more efficient. Uh, now, whether they do that because that is their particular point of view, or whether it is true, doesn't really interest me too much. I'll assume it's true. I'll assume that much of the time, as a way of getting from here to here, self-interest may be cheaper, more efficient than beneficence, goodwill, not for profit. But then the question you ask is, why do we have so much altruism? If it isn't efficient, if it doesn't do this thing, why do we have it? Why do we have so many not-for-profits? Why do we have so many uh, altruistic institutions? Why do we have so many things that 
are inefficient. And at that point, and this is typical of what I'm doing in a variety of areas, I say, but maybe it's because we like altruism. We want it. It pleases us. It is, to use the always infelicitous ways of economists, it is in our utility functions. We like it. Not as a means of getting from here to here, but as an end. We want people to be nice. We like not-for-profit institutions. And if you start talking that way, then whether it is efficient as a way of getting from here to here is as silly as asking whether champagne, a good barbera, a very fine beer even, is an efficient way of defirsting ourselves. It's not, you know, water's cheaper. Or whether a real weather truffles or caviar or porcini mushrooms are a good way of feeding ourselves. It's much more expensive than eating pasta. But we like it, we do it, we use these because we like them. Or to put it in something that people your age uh, ahead. But uh, is sex an efficient way of procreating? It really isn't. You know, we could procreate the way animals are doing with bull farms and sperm things and that. We use sex, which is highly inefficient, because we like it. And the moment you start talking that way and say there is a lot of altruism around because we like it, you suddenly say, you don't need to go into deep, complicated, um, biological or revolutionary theories of why or why not, any more than you do with any taste. Why do we like one thing? Why do we like another? Economists classically say, the gustibus non disputan the best. Concerning taste, there's no dispute. We take taste as given. Now, in my book, I also say that's nonsense. They don't really do that. But, that is the basic theory, and if you take it that way, then altruism, beneficence, not for profit, is there because we like it. But if that is so, and it's so simple, why then haven't economists seen it? You know, it's not that complicated. Why haven't they seen altruism as something that we like and that we're willing to pay for? as we're willing to pay for anything that we like. And the reason is quite interesting. I call it McKeon's paradox, because an economist in Virginia, McKeon, about 40 years ago, said it. And it was, it is meaningless to ask, how much must I pay you to love me for myself alone? That is, if I try to buy your love, I destroy the good. If you try to buy altruism, you destroy it. If I try to buy caviar, if I try to buy sex, if I try to buy any number of other things, I don't destroy it. But with altruism, beneficence, love, if I try to buy it, which is the classic way that economists, again, in their philosophical way, say, we optimize, we decide on the amount of it, if you try to buy beneficence, well-being, all of these things, you destroy it. But not only that, it is equally meaningless, again, typically Chicago economists didn't say this, but it is equally meaningless to say, how can I compel you to love me for myself alone? That is, command, the other classic way that economists know, also destroys that good. I can't command you to love me. And since you cannot optimize it either by markets, pure markets, or optimize it by pure command in the way that economists usually act, they then act as if it isn't there. If we can't deal with it in our system, let's treat it as if it isn't there and treat it only as a means. Which is, of course, wrong because we do have it and we want it. And the moment you put the question this way, you start to say, hmm, okay, I can 
cannot buy your love. I can't pay you to love me. But candy comes. It is a little gift. Some nice way of giving you something may work without destroying it. And if command doesn't work because it destroys, altruism, beneficent, education, teaching people to be altruistic, to be beneficent, which is a very powerful form of command. You're all here. You know how much when he teaches you, he's really commanding you. That also works and doesn't destroy. That immediately suggests something about the theory that is not good enough. The theory of economists has been pure purpose. How much must I pay you to love me for myself alone? Or command. How can I command you to love me? And they don't think of the fact that in the world as it is, most things are dealt with not just by pure markets or by pure commands, but by semi-hemi-demi markets, complicated semi-markets, and complicated semi-hemi commands. It's not the pure, clear theory. There are gifts, there are charitable donations, there are any number of other ways that induce people in a market way without being a pure market to increase the amount of beneficence. And there are all sorts of ways which are semi-command, like education, or like in Minneapolis, which is a city that has more altruistic behavior than any city in the United States. It happens to be the city where my wife's family comes from, and they were founders of this place. And the old families that founded it started for their own reason, giving 10% of the gross of their company to charitable uses. They decided to do it because they wanted to, they liked it. When new companies came, they made it clear to these companies that they would not be accepted if they didn't do the same. So it became a kind of habit in this city. Now, this is command. It's not a direct command. It doesn't destroy in the same way. But it became part of the culture of this city that the big firms do that. And so now, I see this because uh, we have a little family foundation that deals with things in New Haven, in her family, and in Minneapolis. And in New Haven, there's nobody who gives anything except us. In Minneapolis, there are hundreds of things. And what we try to do is to stimulate something or other just because of this tradition that is a form of command that doesn't. And by the way, if you go back and think about Coase and the theory of the firm, when he said firms were more efficient in this context than markets, he was not talking about pure command. When you think of pure command, you think of centralized governmental command. The firm is a decentralized, private form of command. It may be cheaper, it may be more expensive, but he was comparing markets with decentralized, a semi-hemi-hemi form of command, uh, rather than centralized. If he were comparing centralized, he might or might not have found it to be more efficient. OK, so the moment you do this, you suddenly have not just a way of thinking about altruism, and beneficence, and things of that sort. But you also start thinking of all the other things that are, in fact, allocated in ways which are not done by pure market. And that pushes us a bit towards this afternoon's talk, where I'll be talking about allocation of bodies, body parts. I want your brain, because I need it for transplant. No. Uh, I'll leave your brains or your private out. I just need your kidney or your bone marrow. Uh, I can't buy it, or can I? But there may be some semi-heavy-heavy market ways of doing it, 
and of creating a better society in that way. So life calls markets are costly. This then becomes something that serves to analyze well beyond the particular area of altruism. But let's come back to altruism. The moment you see this, and you start talking about something, altruism, something that we like, and that we have, even though it's expensive, because we want it, you then realize that altruism, beneficence, in a society that is a happy society, is not one good. It is not porcini mushrooms, it is not caviar, it is not uh, truffles. It's all of them. That is, people like personal altruism. People like governmental altruism. People like firm altruism. We want some of them. A government in which everybody was personally charitable and just loving, sweet, and very nice. But where the government was like Newt Gingrich's, if you remember that man in the United States at the time, where the national government was fiercely, no, 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 <coughs> nobody gets anything, would not be what we want most. Nor would a situation in which the government took care of people, cradle to grave, was wonderfully and altruistic, but where individuals were all dog-eat-dog, dog, I hate you, I so much, that wouldn't be what we want either. We actually want some of that. And we want individual firms. And you can see that in the way, if you look again at the world. It's rather interesting how firms find it in their interest to behave altruistically because people like it. I happen to be... I, in the United States, I love baseball. In Italy, I love soccer. Uh, and in uh, football. Uh, in, in, uh, I'm a Yankee fan, which is a team. In, and every year, the Yankees go and do things in hospitals, these great players, do all sorts of things. And you know, they may be doing it because they're only three. And they are, to some extent, and it has that effect. But obviously, that corresponds to what people want, and the firm does better because it does some altruistic behavior. And that is a way, again, in a market, semi-heavy demi market, of increasing firm altruism. Well, the moment you see that altruism and not-for-profits is a series of goods, you understand why we have some not-for-profit institutions, some individual altruism, some governmental altruism, some profit firms doing altruistic things, why the world is in fact so much more complex and interesting than the theorem would be. And then you start to ask yourself, well, how much of each? Now this is where it gets hard and where my own work hasn't yet gone that far. But you know, I'm 82, so I think my job is to show things for people like you, and then let, then let you take the next step and do the analysis. Because it's easy enough to figure out how much caviar we want by how much people want power, or how much uh, something which is a pure market or pure command. It's much harder to figure out how, when you're dealing with semi-heavy demi-markets and semi-heavy demi-commands, how much we want and how much we want of each. You can get some indications that we do want it. For example, in the United States, the people who run not-for-profit institutions like hospitals and universities and things like that, are paying enormous amounts of money. Hospital people who run not-for-profit hospitals are among the people who earn most. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that somebody who is good at making it look as if something is being delivered altruistically satisfies us in ways that we are willing to pay 
a great deal for it. So we do have hints about how much we value these things in the market. And when we're talking about setting them in command, it's easier because then it's always a decision. But then the question is, how much of each? And if you start to look, you then start to go back to the fact that this good is not only a good in itself, but is also a means to delivering things. The fact that I said we have altruism in our utility function and this is something we want doesn't mean that it isn't also a way of getting health care, sanitation, any number of things that. That is, it is both an end and a means. And as you might expect, you then look and you see that those areas which we have altruism are ones, or not-for-profit, are ones which are pretty good as means. They don't cost so much as means and are important to us as ends. That is, where do you have a comparative advantage? The mixture of what we have reflects that we want health care and we want it delivered relatively cheaply, but we also want altruism. So altruism, as against self-interest, tends to concentrate in those areas which give us the most pleasure from seeing people become altruistic, and yet which delivers the good at a relatively low cost. That is, can I buy truffles cheaply, relatively cheaply, in January, and porcini mushrooms at another time? That is, where is it? What combination serves to do that? And if you start to look at the world that way, you find very interesting mixtures and combinations. But you also find, as always in the world as it is also, people taking advantage. That is, sometimes the world isn't good. But now you have a system of analyzing that helps you to criticize and say, we would do better, we'd get more pleasure at less cost if people were more altruistic in this area and maybe more for profit or command in another area and, uh, uh, and in another area yet, instead you get more private, we get more benefit from private altruism in another area from firm altruism and so on, and you start to look at the world as it is in its wonderful and interesting complexity, which most classical economists simply do not do. Now, why don't economists do that? You know, this is the thing that this book is very concerned about. And the reason is a simple one. Economists, like all of us, even like you, are lazy. That is, it is easier to do things if they are simple. If you have a nice, simple Chicago model in which you put everything into a machine, turn it out, and out come sausages. You know, it's just much easier to have a simple model than a complex model. And to make things complicated makes life harder. And sometimes it's not worth making life hard. Sometimes it's easier to keep things simple. The model works better. But it all depends on what you're analyzing. If you're analyzing a simple, ordinary good, then the simple, ordinary model may work well. If you're analyzing something as complex as well-being, as altruism, as beneficence, then you'll only be able to analyze it if you make a model complicated. And at that point, you can say to the economist or to any theorist, do you want to make the model complicated, hard as it is for you, and bring in semi-commands, semi-markets, and so on, and be relevant as a theorist to the world? Or do you want to say, I'm sorry, I can't do it? If you say, I'm sorry, I can't do it, and are honest about it, then the economist has little to say about what decisions will be made in the world. 
What I can't stand is when an economist or a philosopher or a bananologist, I don't care what, any theorist, pretends to tell us to do things in the world, but does not want to be complicated enough in their theory to tell us something that is relevant. Because then they just mislead us. But if honestly an economist or somebody else says, I'm sorry, I can't do it. It ruins my field, my theory. OK, too bad. Then we have to have anthropologists, sociologists, a whole lot of weaker social sciences help us out, and we deal with that. I happen to think that economists, if they are pushed and pushed out of a narrow scheme, are still people who can be very, very helpful. So that part of my job is to tell them, get off your butt and start doing things which are interesting. You may not get all the way there, but you can be more helpful to us in figuring out how much altruism of what sort, by whom, national, local, individual, firm, not-for-profit, is the best combination that we have. One other thing that this way of looking at things is useful for, and this is a completely different thing, because it gets away from altruism itself and gets into things uh, well beyond it. Remember where I started. Altruism, beneficence, is both a means and an end. It is both a way of getting from here to there, and it is also something that we like. When you say that, you immediately realize that though well, that is particularly true of altruism, it is also true of any number of other things. Any number of goods are also means and ends. Pasta is a very good way of feeding. It's a very good means of feeding. I love it. It is very high up in my utility function. <laughs> Potatoes are a good way of feeling. They're much lower in my utility function. And so it is with many, many goods. Goods, services, almost everything is both means and ends. And one of the fascinating things about economics is that they very look at, very rarely look at the things in both their capacity. And if you start to look at things, both as means and as ends, it becomes extremely interesting how much of each one we have and why we have it. And that is really something that is not particularly a matter of altruism, it's just that looking at altruism teaches you to do that and to do that well beyond you. And when you do that, you notice something fascinating. If you go back and read Coase's original article on the theory of the firm, Coase, then a socialist, says, but it may be that we have firms, not just because it is cheaper to have them, because markets are costly, but because some people, Coase himself is a socialist, like them. They like command. They like a direct thing as against markets. Coase already saw that back then, and when he writes The Problem of Social Cost, if you read it carefully, he isn't only saying, and by the way, libertarian markets and so on are ways which are efficient ways, sometimes cheaper ways of doing things than command, but there are also people who will choose them because they like them. Because they like a market way of dealing with other people rather than a command way. And you cannot, you know, this insight, which Coase had just sort of in passing, he didn't 
is barely a throwaway, but which comes out of what we've been saying about ends and means of things, which go now to the broadest system. What kind of system do we have? Do we have a command system? Do we have a market system, a libertarian system, or a command system, or a mixed system, a social democratic system? When you think about it this way, you realize that the system we have is in part because it is efficient means, but also in part because we like it. You cannot read Van Hayek and the great libertarian scholars without realizing that at some point he is saying, and even if markets don't work that well, I think they do, I think they do, I think they do, but even if they don't work that well, I like them. And you cannot read Trotsky or the great command people without realizing that Trotsky, who was very smart, by the way, said, yeah, it's an efficient way of doing things, but even if it isn't, I like it. It's quite interesting, Trotsky, because, uh, you know, Coase, as a libertarian, said, if markets, if there were no transaction costs, and we had perfect knowledge, then markets would do everything perfectly, which, of course, is true. Trotsky, but then Coase says, but we don't. We don't know, and so markets don't work, and there are all these problems. Trotsky, and I enjoy citing him and Coase together, <laughs> Trotsky said, if we knew everything, then we could do everything by command perfectly. But of course, we don't know everything. So command, so they were saying the same thing from opposite points of view, and from a point of view of what they like. You will see in this book another thing which I talked about just recently in Bologna, uh, about uh, the liability rule, which is a halfway measure. It isn't pure command and it isn't pure market, it's somewhere in between, which I say is a social democratic. It is not command or pure market as a way of doing things. And sometimes it is clearly most efficient. But it is also true that in ma many modern social democratic societies, we use it where command might be more efficient or where markets might be more efficient. And we use it because people in the social democratic society like it. They like a way that is somewhere in between. Not for me to say which of these is better. That's for all of you and your politics and your ideology. It is for me to say that if you analyze things both as ends and as means, and that not only particular goods, easy goods like pasta, and that not only difficult goods like altruism, beneficence, not for profits, both as ends and means, but even a whole system of structure, not just ends, not just means, but both, and what you prefer, for whatever reasons, put that in your utility function you like, then you get a better sense of what the world is and a better way of analyzing it, so then you can use that to be better from your point of view to argue with those who would do better from their point of view and hopefully come out with something which makes the world, the world, not the theory, the world, a better place for all of us. any sort about what I've said here, or about what a judge does, or about what a professor does in the United States, or what a judge does in the United States. Because, you know, as a judge, I am quite peculiar from an Italian point of view. I'm on a court which is essentially the equivalent of a court of cassation. Yeah. <coughs> we are the last words in almost everything. We decide, my court will decide 2,000, 3,000 cases a year. 
of these, the Supreme Court might, might take as many as two, two in a year. And we know perfectly well which ones they'll be, because there are cases which, for certain reasons, we know they're going to take. So as for most things, we are a court of last resort. But we are a court of last resort in a very odd way, because we are, I am, a judge who is penal, civil, administrative, bankruptcy, tax, pensions, constitutional, administrative. I know everything. <laughs> the American judge deals with everything. And so I'm, in that sense, a very unusual judge, though realize that while that is the structure of the United States, and so I'm a judge who deals with every single issue that there can be, uh, that this, though it's very antithetical to the civil law system, is becoming more this way as European courts have to deal with the relationship between local law and European law. So that many courts here that traditionally have always been very narrow in a way, now that they have to apply European law, are pushed to some degree to become more like American judges. And this is a problem, because they don't know how to do it, they haven't been trained to, and so on. But, but it is, if one thing you might ask me is how we deal with these things, and why, why we don't separate us into different things, and how that works. So, the floor is yours, and be careful, because if you don't start talking, I may call it. <laughs> <laughs> don't be scared. Let, let's try to use the microphone, because there should be... Let's see. Okay, let's use the microphone. Right. Speak loud, because no, I really have a very hard hearing, and I'm sorry, so it's just the way I, whenever I talk to people about altruism, sure. when I talk to people about altruism, yeah. I get usually the response, often the response, that altruism does not exist. Um, does not exist? No, exactly. Uh, because basically if we do something nice for other people, it is really to maximize our personal utility function. So really a self-interested behavior. And I was curious what your response to that. That's a very good question. question. Uh, now, of course, I may get pleasure from doing something that is altruistic. Of course, I may get pleasure from something that is altruistic. Uh, the question is, is that the reason it is there? It is there only as a form of self-interest. Or is that pleasure itself something that is my utility function? It is, I like it because I like other people to behave that way, and so I like to feel that I behave that way. Now, let's be clear. There are certainly times when people, though altruistic, do it very much for their own self-interest. If I were to, which I'm not about to, though you will have a speaker here in a few weeks in this same series, somebody who is the Guido Calabresi Professor of Law in Yale, and he's coming here. If I had given that chair, you might say, I might have given it not because I wanted to help Yale, but because I wanted to feel good about myself. I didn't give that chair. I'm glad somebody did. Now, but think about it. When, even in that situation, maybe some of it is self-serving, but some of it is also wanting to help. And people do it, sometimes, anonymously. You know how the Bible says, uh, when you do penance or give charity, do not do it openly like the hypocrites. They have their reward already. Do it in your chamber, in the closet, 
where God who sees in the closet says, uh, that way of describing is too simplistic. To say that there is some of that is certainly true. But why do people say that as a generic matter? They say it because since they can't explain altruism when they view it as an end, they have to find a way that explains it as a means. It isn't there. And that is an insight, and it's a good insight, that sometimes it happens. And sometimes, I have a very good friend, Cosimo Mazzoni, in uh, Florence, who was writing about gift giving, and gift giving as sometimes be one of the most horrible things, and I'm not really giving a gift, I want somebody to owe me something for it. And of course, that's true too. But to look at it that way only is that hypnotism to see the world, which doesn't mean it has its, doesn't have its place. And then you want to ask, to what extent does allowing somebody to do something which is both altruistic and pays off help satisfy others of us who want altruism to be there. And when you do it with comparative advantage, you may very well want to do something which gives people some direct, non-altruistic benefit, but which has altruistic effect. Hugo, as person who runs this thing, has become a universal mendicant. He goes up to a foundation and says, do things for us. Does the foundation do it only for its own pleasure? Or also because uh, it is doing something altruistic? Well, it's both to some extent. I was dean of Yale Law School for almost 10 years. And in the United States, the dean is the total mendicant. <laughs> I became famous as an incredibly good fundraiser. And, uh, one of the interesting things was how often I would be met by people who would say, I would like to give money, but I don't really want my name. Maybe I want my parents' name, but I don't really want my name on it. I don't want the room or the chair or the thing to be made after me. And I would always say to them, OK, but look at the life you have led. You know, you're a person who spent all her life doing public works. And it happens that you also came into some money and you don't have children, so you can give it away. If you give something which bears your name and has your portrait, this becomes a story that I can tell the kids. I can tell them this is a life led in the law. And that's worth doing. So you are doing this. Yes, it has your name on it. Maybe that's good, and it will give you some satisfaction. But don't worry about it, because it is altruistic, not just in the sense that it's helping Yale, but it is helping people see the life led in the law. I'd love to have a chair at Yale in the name of Hugo Mate. I'd love to have it, because he's such a nut. He's lived such an interesting life of doing things which are difficult, doing things which are perplexing to people. I love, I take my students around to see the portraits. And I say, this one is here for this reason. Here is a judge who, when he was dean, when a student who was desperately poor came up to him, when he was graduating, this old dean said, you will never get a job. And the person said, why? He said, because you're not dressed right. And firms will not hire you. Here's some money. Go out and buy some clothes for yourself, a nice suit. And when I told that story, two or three people, one children and one old man came up to me and said, you know, a much earlier dean, who always looked very stern and became a judge, did the same thing for my grandfather, who was a poor, the last one was a poor African American. The first one was a poor Jew who had emigrated from Russia, Lithuania or something. And I got this picture 
the beads of the Yale Law School buying suits for people going <laughs> forever. But what a wonderful story. So this is by way of saying that, yes, of course there is that, but it's much more. Again, the world is more sophisticated. And think about, again, it's just a broken record repeating, think about, again, why people try to explain it in that way, because it doesn't fit the theory that it's only a means, not a thing. I, I would like to keep on the, the definition of altruism, but not much from the atomistic point of view, but more from the relationship point of view, and especially from the legal perspective. So, uh, and the, but the question would be something like, what's the definition of altruism, and how does it fit um, with the contract? Yeah. So, some certain altruism, which is just giving, it's pretty easy to define the relationship. Other yeah, things where you have services are much more difficult. And, and liability comes yeah. into the picture. Now, uh, <laughs> yours is a wonderful question, which I'm not going to answer. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I say it's a wonderful question is that when I wrote this in my book, I said, should I give a definition of altruism? And in a real sense, what to criticize what I have said today and in my book because I do not get a definition and say it is this here, that there, something more complicated. The reason I don't do it is precisely because it is so many different goods. And sometimes a good, sometimes less a good, it is many different things in a donation, but even in a donation, it isn't purely altruistic, in a contractual. And what I say is, the definition is not going to be, when we come to it, is not going to be a nice, simple definition. It's a definition that will arise after a kind of analysis that my asking questions is going to cause people like you to do. For me to define it now, is to act as if I know what the next steps in this where I have only taken the first step is going to be. And while I could say some things, and in my Guido-centered view of the world, I might be quite pleased with you, it wouldn't really be honest. Because you need much more analysis of the thing you just started to say, what about contracts, what about that, that would come out. And then we would see how many different goods they are, when what is in our utility functions is something which is very different from something else, keeping in mind that we do like people to be nice. We like it a lot. And there are times instead when we get benefit from it, and that this set of goods is not altruism, one, or not-for-profit, one, but is a series of different things which have different functions, which are as different from each other, though related, as Barolo is to Chianti, to Sassicaia, and to good, clear water. Then may I get a second shot? Uh, so, so May I, ask you, may I ask you if you have seen insights and how the, the liability would work there. We have a rule under the Italian Civic Code that if you, for certain contracts, if you do it for free, then your the judgment over the misconduct, whether it was um, uh, by the, like, misconduct is relevant under liability rules, is less severe than we we yes. that this is, do you have insights on this point? Yeah. This is uh, quite, quite, quite common in, uh, uh, in common law as well. Uh, in the common law, for example, in torts, uh, you're talking contract, but I'm talking torts. If I lend you my horse for your benefit, this is the law of bailment, uh, you are liable 
for even the slightest degree of negligence, because I've given it to you as a favor to you. If it is mutuality of interest, I rent you my horse, you are liable only for ordinary negligence. If I give you my horse to look after in my interest, you are liable only for gross negligence because it is in my interest. So that the law, more sophisticated than economists, already recognizes different degrees of behavior, altruistic on one side, mutual interest on another, altruistic on the other side, and determines liability for it. What would be interesting would be to look at these areas of law. I've never done that. I haven't thought, frankly, I haven't thought of it this way. But what you just said makes me think of it, that this is a way also in which the law, the experience of mankind, says Mill, already says there are different goods, different types of not-for-profit behavior, which should be recognized in the law in different ways. Good. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Loud, loud. loud. I have two questions. The first question is that uh, it's really following his question, but on another side, is that uh, you talk about our system and uh, it's the means and also the ends, and you try to have the objectives from here to there. And sometimes we have the we have the you know, good desire and uh, we want to be good. And the objectives is uh, really real personal, real society, and uh, they may function, may not function with us in our thinking. Yes and the access is kind of breaking. So what do you think about it? And the second question is about uh, the command structure and the market structure. I didn't quite understand it. How about the structure? The, the, the command versus the market. I think. Yes, yeah. you talk about liability rule. I didn't quite get it. So maybe could you explain a little bit later? No, I didn't hear the last. Uh, could you explain that, that a little bit? More about liability rule. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. So the first question is, uh, sometimes it doesn't work, yes. you know. Sometimes it doesn't happen, and uh, and then when somebody says that, I say, why are you so surprised here when you're not surprised about the same thing in other typical goods? Sometimes when I try to buy a good, I don't get it. You cheat on it, or I can't buy it, or something goes wrong. Or sometimes when I get a good by command, it doesn't work in, in the most ordinary goods. Why should you worry more about this in a complex good like altruism unless you have already said somehow this is a problem? Now, the way economists treat the other is quite interesting to say, of course, sometimes people who are inefficient will continue to stay in business for a while, but pretty quickly they'll be out. You know, in time, it will, there'll be a sorting out, and the same would for men. And the same would apply, I would guess, with altruism. If it doesn't work to do it one way, after a while you won't see that much of it. But at any given moment in a society, you will see any number of things that don't work. You will see firms, sellers of things that are terribly inefficient or command things that don't work well. You hope that if the structure is right, in time they'll be worked out. And I remember that there was an automobile repair place in New Haven that was so bad, just so bad in what it did, that I said to myself, you know, if this continues to remain for more than a year or two, I will lose all my faith in the market. Because it really cannot be. Well, fortunately, they went broke soon yes. enough, and I was able to be a good Chicago. Well, I, I, have, a call, I have a colleague that is so stupid, and he's a very successful attorney, that I lost all the faith in the fact that professionals must be smart. Well, that's right. So it's a, it, and I can't explain that because he's the most idiotic people I ever met. However, he makes five million a year as a lawyer. So you say, well, is that possible? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so then to the second question, <coughs> the liability rule is a whole other lecture and a whole other thing. Uh, there are 
things that we allocate according to markets. There are things which we allocate according to command. But there are also situations in which the collectivity lets you do things if you wish to do them, if you pay a price or an assessment that is set by the collectivity. That is, the pure market would say, I want to buy your nose. Will you sell it to me or not? The purely collective will say, your nose is yours or your nose is mine. Or better, let's say your hair. I have need for your hair, you don't, and so on. That would be the one. Uh, the liability rule is when you are able to do things which will take what is mine, but when you do it, you don't go to jail. You simply have to pay a certain amount to me that is set by the collective. The most common of this is in tort law. You drive a car, you injure me, you take my body. And if you drive a car or run a bus or something of that sort, you know that's going to happen sooner or later. But we don't jail you. Sometimes we tell you there are things you can't do and we'll go to jail if you do. Sometimes we'll tell you there are things that you can do and you don't need to pay. But any number of things, you injure me, you have to pay. And the price, if it is a price, is what is set by the collectivity. It determines how much you take and how much you don't. How much you do and how much you don't. This is what I call the liability rule. And the same thing applies in eminent domain expropriation. Somebody can take goods, property, for a public use. I don't want to sell it. The state doesn't just take it from me and give it to somebody else. It allows somebody who is doing it for a public use to take it and to pay a certain amount. It is not pure market because I can't say no. It is not pure collective because we don't order the result. It depends on whether you want to pay. And this is this third way, which is the liability rule. And the article that I've written which probably has been cited more than any, certainly than anything else I've written, and some people say that it is a private law article that has been most cited in the world, is something called property rules, liability rules, and inalienability, one view of the cathedral, commonly called the cathedral. And it is cited all the time, whether it really is the most cited private law thing ever depends on how you define private law. <laughs> uh, if you included coast as private law, but they don't, then mine would not. But it's, it's what I like because it's always fuzzier than people think. Now, the interesting thing to me is that one uses the liability rule sometimes when it is simply more effective because I can't go out and negotiate with everybody who I might injure. So the best we can do is a liability rule. Or from the other end, I cannot prohibit everything, and so I use a liability rule rather than prohibition. So sometimes we use it, this middle ground, because it is more efficient. But there are many situations where we use the liability rule when we could do it in another way, where there is medical malpractice or product liability. I'm negotiating with you. This could be a price or situations where we could prohibit. And yet we use the liability rule rather than pure market or pure collective. Why? Because we are social democracy, someplace in the middle, and we like it. Uh, now, what I've just written now about the liability rule is that almost everybody who has written about it, and in all these citations, and maybe even I, not intentionally, and Doug Melamed, who was my student who wrote it with me, 
uh, when we wrote it, we're thinking that the liability rule should mirror, should mimic a price, should be as close to what a negotiated libertarian price would be if only we could have a price. What is it we would sell this for if people could buy it? What am I in an eminent domain? What is the market value or price of my product? But again, if you look at the real world, that isn't how it works. There are times when the price, the assessment, the penalty that is set tries to mimic the real market. And there are times when it almost looks like inalienability. It says you can do it, and we won't put you in jail, but you're going to have to pay much more than the market price. Would we get punitive damages? Would we have runaway juries? In any number of situations where the price that is charged to you is not a price, it's an assessment. It's not an assessment, it's a penalty. And sometimes it's somewhere in between. So that in fact, this middle ground is one that is sometimes used where we choose not to make something inalienable. Or sometimes we want people to take it for less. And I'll give you an example, both in eminent domain, both two examples of this. In Italy, for many years, and in many, many European countries, when the government took something by eminent domain for a public purpose, it did not pay the market value. It paid the value in use. So if I had a great villa, which I wanted to keep as a great villa because I wanted to be a great lord, and the value of the market, if I sold it for industrial development, would be much more than the value as a villa, and somebody took, the state took the villa for a public purpose, they wouldn't pay me the market value. The liability rule says pay less because we want this to shift. We don't mind, we don't force you not to be a great lord, but you do it at your peril. If we need it, we may take it for less. I know that very well because according to family legend, my great uncle, who was a great economist, had a villa outside of Bologna and it was not worth much as agricultural land and villa, which is what he kept it as. Industry was getting closer, and so it was worth considerably more on the market. He claimed that he wasn't selling it, not because he wanted to be a great lord, but because the increased value from industry coming in was greater than the rate of interest, and so as he was an economist, he thought it was too soon to sell. Whether it was that he was being a good economist in comparing the rate of interest with the increased value, or whether he wanted to be a great lord, who knows? Maybe both. The fact is, according to family legend, is that when the town fathers and mothers of Bologna decided that they wanted an airport, they looked and they saw all this empty land at Borgo Panigale, near Bologna, which belonged to my great uncle, and said, gee, this looks like a wonderful place to have an airport. And they took it and they paid him value in use with a result that I'm much less rich than I would be if he hadn't been so much of a lord or so much of an economist. That is, here's a situation where the collectivity sets the price, not at market, but at less, for social democratic reasons. Now I'll give you the opposite. There was recently a case in the United States called Kelo, K-E-L-O, in which some private developers wanted to take individual houses in New London, very near New Haven, where I live. It had been an area that had fallen into disrepair, and these people wanted to take that property and build fancier housing. It was a nice area, gentrified. And this was a public purpose. But these were private people 
who were given the right of eminent domain to take these private houses for a public purpose. Uh, these people sued, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, it's a public purpose, you can do it. You can take their property and pay market value. There was an incredible stink. People were furious, people were demonstrating in front of the judges who said it was okay, they said it's terrible to do this. Why? Because these were private developers taking private property for a public purpose. So it was a public purpose, but that seemed wrong. During the argument, Justice Kennedy, who, let's face it, is not the sharpest knife in the drama. He's not the most intelligent person. But this he saw, he said, wouldn't he feel a lot better about this if instead of paying the market price, we had the developer pay three or four times? That is, not limit the market, but say you can do this for a public purpose, but the opposite of what they did with my great uncle, you have to pay more. We don't forbid it, but you have to pay more. And this again is the liability rule as a way in between. The mistake of the cathedral, and I've just written an article on this, saying a broader view of the cathedral. The mistake of the cathedral is that it thinks the original article of this as a price, as a license to do this if you can pay the price. And the real way to look at the world is sometimes it is a price. Sometimes we try to mimic the price because that's what we want. Sometimes we try to make it come as close to the native ability. You can do it, but boy, you have to pay a lot. And sometimes it's something in between because that's what the social democracy wants. So it's a long answer, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a deep topic. Now here's something that's going to be difficult. He asked me a very difficult question, yes. <laughs> when we talk about altruism, uh, my I won't very well pass to Saria. You know, because one fundamental goal of Saria is to be selfless as a law. In these approaches, when we look at uh, countries uh, that, that are ruled by Sharia, we see that many people are torn to beggars because of this concept. Because they wait from the Ibn you know, the, 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 the Islamic, the Islamic uh, uh, Mangishi, where everyone can have an, uh, a hand in and you are given by this, or you are given from this magazine to do anything that you want. So at the end, many people are torn to be beggars, even in Saudi Arabia as of now. And in 2012, they have even changed their uh, uh, is, uh, oil producing laws towards this very poor. So, but my, my, my question is, what is the rule of law towards equity and efficiency? Yeah. Well, what is the rule of law between equity and efficiency? <coughs> you could say I've spent my whole life uh, trying to deal with that, so I'm not going to give you uh, uh, much of an answer now, but it is certainly true that sometimes we will have laws that are there, that are clearly inefficient, if you're talking about ways of getting from here to here, or ways of making things bigger in general, and, uh, and Sharia may be one, and there are many laws in every system that are designed for what they think of direct justice. There are things that we do not want to have allocated in the market. The question of when we do this, and in what systems we do this, at what cost to general development, economic well-being, as against this moral well-being, is at the root of what a man named Oakham, who was a professor at Yale who died young, called the great trade-off. We are always asking, how much of one and how much of the other. And there isn't a single society, whether it is collectivistic, whether it is market libertarian or in between, it doesn't have to face that question. And one of the things, actually, that I do in this book 
is to talk about this with respect to a particular set of goods. There are some goods that Jim Tobin and Musgrave years ago called merit goods, which are goods that we do not allocate in Western societies according to the market. We don't let the market decide how we allocate body parts. We'll talk about that this afternoon, kidneys, whatever. But also a minimal level of education, a minimal level of health, and so on. We don't allocate them in the market. Why don't we? Why don't we? The market might be a very efficient way of doing that. But many of us are offended if only the poor give up their kidneys, sell their kidneys to those who need them, or only the rich get education or health care. Or if you want to talk about something else, serving in the army in wartime, if you have a purely volunteer army, only the poor volunteer and get killed, and the rich stay home. Now, one way of doing it, of dealing with this, would be to make the whole society so egalitarian in wealth differences that there aren't rich and there aren't poor. And that's the way that a professor at Harvard named Chavel, who is very nice but doesn't really see beyond economics in the narrowest way, says you should do it. But the trouble with doing it that way is that then we don't have all sorts of other incentives. If everybody was equal, we wouldn't have incentives to make any number of goods. And what in fact, if you look at the real world we do, we say we can tolerate a certain amount of inequality, generally, so long as, as to these goods, we allocate them in a way that is either outside the market, by direct allocation, or in a market which is wealth distribution more neutral. So that if we made the rich pay much more for a kidney and gave it to the poor, we might well allow people to buy kidneys. Or if we said the rich to stay out of the army have to pay a huge amount and the poor little, we might well have a market. But it's a market that would be based on a greater equality. The way during wartime we had rationing and did the same thing. Uh, this is both, again, a way of looking at the world which tells us, but it is also a way of focusing on a more sophisticated way of dealing with that great trade-off between equity and efficiency, and say, in the real world, we don't just say, we want equity and therefore we want everybody to be equal, or we want efficiency so we allocate everything that way, we will take some goods out and allocate them another way. And again, economists, for certain peculiar reasons, have never explained why these are there. In my Guido-centered view of the universe, I think that this book will explain it, which is why this book is not going to be popular. <laughs> Good. I think it's time for lunch. <laughs> Thank you.